All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I think this should be everyone. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started with today. So uh, to begin uh, with all things, we're going to begin in prayer. Um, and if I could ask everyone to please turn on their videos just so I can make sure y'all are here and I can see your wonderful, wonderful faces. Perfect. Love it. All right. We'll begin in prayer. So in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, let your presence be known. Father, we thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you for this gift of a new day and a gift of life. We ask that you please continue to protect us, to keep us healthy and safe, uh, and to continue to open our eyes and our hearts to your truth and to your love, that we might continually be brought closer to you. We ask this through the intercession of our blessed mothers. We pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so if you guys didn't see um, when you came in, we are going to be talking about why do we be, why are we Catholic? Or why should any of us be Catholic? Um, and you'll kind of tell by the, uh, the quote that we'll use, um, upon this rock, I will build my church. It's kind of a, a building off of what we did last meeting with uh, why I believe in Jesus. It's the same reading as we used, and we'll use it later. Um, but why be Catholic? There's a lot of different denominations, um, a lot of different Christians in this world. Why, do, why should we be Catholic? Why should we enter the Catholic church and go through confirmation? Um, so a great way to start this out is a lovely video uh, that I'll share with you guys right now. Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and this is Ascension Presents. I get asked a lot of times, um, Father, so you're Catholic, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yep, yeah, I am. They say, so what's the difference? What's the main difference between like the Catholic Church and any of the other like Protestant denominations or non-Catholic churches? Maybe it would be this. Maybe it would be authority. Um, and I know that's a bad word. Uh, that's in some for many of us we don't like it. We're like, Ugh, authority. I don't. That doesn't. That doesn't sit right with me. What do you mean authority? I would say this. Um. um that the church has the ability to teach us. They teach authoritatively. The church has the ability to teach us in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father. That the church has the ability to tell us this is true, that's not true. That the church has the ability to um, establish doctrine. And I'm not talking about some invisible kind of like universal body of believers. I'm talking about the church that Jesus himself founded back in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus looks at Simon and says, Simon, your name is not Peter, rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He goes on to say, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, here's the interesting thing that you may or may not know. Jesus came to establish the kingdom, right? But it's not an invisible kingdom, why? Because we can look that Jesus as the king establishes the kingdom. But when he says to Peter, no, you know, Simon, now Peter, he says, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom, et cetera, et cetera. He's referencing Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And in Isaiah, there is this role in the kingdom. There's a role. There's the king, obviously. But there's also the prime minister, the al-Habait, the one who's the overseer. That when the king is gone, this person is in charge. This person has the authority of the king. It says that in Isaiah chapter 22. And it's almost word for word what Jesus gives to Peter, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He gives the church a visible structure and an actual hierarchy. And he says, you can actually teach now, teach in my name. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth to be able to teach in my name. And this is exactly what happens. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, there's this big crisis. And the crisis is um, the apostles have been evangelizing the Jews. So basically they were all Jews and uh, they realized Jesus is the fulfillment of Judaism. Jesus is the Messiah we've been waiting for. They've been evan so they're sharing the good news with Jewish people. It was awesome. But then they realized because Peter had a vision, and Paul was called to do this too, that they were called to bring the gospel to non-Jews. 
which is amazing and good because I'm, I'm a non-Jew and I get, I get to be brought in, right, to the, to the, the people of God. The question came up, okay, so when you evangelize Jews, all they need to get is baptized because they're already circumcised. They're already in the old covenant. So in order to be brought into the fulfillment of the covenant, the new covenant, they just have to be baptized. But if you're evangelizing Gentiles, question, do they first have to be circumcised and then be baptized? Or can they just be baptized? Now you can see at least two ways why this would be a very important question. One is if you were an adult Gentile man, this would kind of be a big question you would want answered before you, do I have to do this or do I, is this kind of optional? Um, you want that resolved ahead of time. But secondly, and even more importantly, if I need to get circumcised in order to get baptized and I'm not, that means I'm not saved. Like, do we have to do this in order to be saved is the big question. The problem is Jesus never taught about that. The Bible never teaches about this. And this is the problem, the problem with a thing called sola scriptura or, or Bible alone. You know, one of the, one of the pillars of the Reformation um, was this idea that Bible alone, scriptural, you don't need the church, only the Bible alone. What about when the Bible doesn't teach something, what do we do? Well, what happened was in Acts chapter 15, the apostles came together. And again, I'm not saying some loose kind of invisible church, but the actual structure of the church, those apostles, the people that um, Jesus himself called, Peter as the Pope, Paul and Barnabas, you have this body of the church. And the church gets together and they discuss and they debate and they pray and then they decided. They said, it seems to the Holy Spirit and to us that we should not impose this on Gentiles. They should not, they don't not, they do not have to be circumcised in order to be baptized. And in that moment, we can see in the Bible that the church, again, the visible church, the structure of the church, the governance, governance of the church has the ability to teach. And not just to teach, but to teach definitively, not merely optionally. And if you're a student of history, you see that this is not the only time. In fact, the church has to do this again and again and again because people pick up the Old Testament and pick up the New Testament scriptures, which also the church gave us, another video, by the way. And, and they say, well, I come to the conclusion that Jesus isn't really God. I mean, he's clearly God. I mean, he, 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 he came to earth, he rose from the dead. He's clearly God. I think he only looked like human. That was a heresy called docetism. In fact, it was one of the earliest heresies was that Jesus was fully God, but he wasn't fully man. In the church, again, not this generic, invisible church, but the actual physical structure, hierarchy of the church said, that's incorrect. Um, the other people came along and said, well, he's, he's fully human, but maybe he's only like partly God, like quasi, quasi-God, um, like the Arians. And the church came together in Council of Nicaea, 325, and they said, no, Jesus is fully God and fully man. Two natures, human and divine, in one divine person. Now, every Christian in the world believes that. Why? Because in some way, whether they admit it or not, every single Christian in the world believes that the Catholic Church has the authority to teach. Every Christian who believes in the Trinity, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, that no, no one's greater than the other, believes that because of the authority of the Catholic Church. Because they, the Church came together in the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople, and all the other Church councils, and declared this, that this is the interpretation of the text. And we need that. Here's the crazy thing. We need that so badly. Okay, here's a little mental exercise. Imagine that you're a God. For some of you, this will not be the first time today that you did this. And it's so important to you that the people you created know who you truly are, that they don't get you wrong. And so what do you do? Well, you don't want to overwhelm them with your beauty and your power and glory and, and truth because that they would have to serve you out of fear. You want them to fall in love with you and you want them to know who you truly are. And so you start small. You start with this guy named Abraham, or Abram, you know, turn his name to Abraham. And you bring him slowly and slowly. And then his family, you reveal yourself slowly to his family and to this tribe and then to this people. You call the Jewish people, the chosen people of God, and you slowly reveal yourself to them and very carefully because you don't want them to get any part of you wrong. And then in the fullness of time, 2,000 years ago, you yourself actually become one of them. You become a human being. And in that, you reveal who you truly are, and you don't do it as the most powerful one, or as the greatest one, or as the richest one. You take the lowest place as a humble, poor person, and you die as a criminal. You let yourself be overwhelmed by suffering and death. Why? Because it's so important to you as God that people know your, the truth and depth of your heart. Then you rise from the dead and you send your Holy Spirit to the apostles, and then they write down all these things. And while they're writing these things down, you preserve it. Why? Because it's very important to you as God that they write down exactly what you want them to write down and no more, no less. 
And then over the course of years, as they're translating it, as they're copying it, you, but your Holy Spirit, you guide that copying, you guide that translating so that they don't get you wrong. Why? Because it's very important to you as God that no one gets you wrong. Here's this infallible book, right? It's a book that has, it's, it's without error. Now, it's not without scientific error because it's not a scientific book. It's a book of poetry, it's a book of truth, it's a book of goodness. There's a whole other video about that. The point is, you compile this infallible book through fallible people. But you compile this infallible book. Now, if you were God, would it make any sense for you to then say, okay, to anyone, okay, here's this infallible book, boom, I'll take it, read it, tell me what you think. No, you wouldn't. Why? Because an infallible book without an infallible interpreter is a worthless book, right? The Bible is infallible, but without an infallible interpreter, interpreter it's like that's why you have 30,000 plus denominations of Christianity in the United States. Because, you know, someone picks it up and says, oh, here's what I think. Someone else picks it up, no, 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 here's what I think. That's one of the reasons why G.K. Chesterton, back in the day, he had said why he was Catholic. They said, he said, because I don't need a church who can tell me when I'm right. I need a church that will tell me where I'm wrong. So if you ask, you know, what's the big difference between the Catholic church and all other non-Catholic Christian denominations? I'd say when it comes down to it, I think what it comes down to is right there, authority. From all of us here at Ascension Presents, my name is Father Mike. God bless. Okay. Um, I love Father Mike Schmitz. He's a great, great uh, resource to look up. Um, he's on YouTube and he posts up every week. Uh, he also does his masses online too. So if you can't make it to mass in person, uh, make sure that you give him a check out because I think he's really, really great and really awesome. So uh, just a recap of our last meeting. Um, we talked about why we believe in Jesus. So our first meeting, we talked about why I believe in God at all. And so we established all the, all the reasons that we think there is a God and that he exists. Um, and then the last meeting that we had, we had talked about who is Jesus? Why do we believe in him? So we found, we just, we talked about how Jesus was a historical figure. Uh, he was a real definitive person that existed in history and a lot of different people talked about him, uh, but he came with a universal claim. Um, he was a man, he was a teacher, and he was a prophet who spoke on behalf of God. Um, but he was different in that he claimed to be the son of God um, and God himself. He also claimed to fulfill the Torah. So that was the scripture that God's uh, message to the world that he revealed himself with. Um, and that he also came to fulfill the mission to bring about his kingdom upon the earth. Uh, we also talked about how Jesus was the final saving action of God. So throughout history, God was continually saving his people because People kind of suck at being good a lot, uh, and we need help. So God has continually helped us throughout uh, all of scripture, and he finally did his final one with Jesus. Um, and so everything in Jesus's mystery was for the salvation of everyone, not just his chosen people, not just a few that are supposed to be saved, and then a few that God doesn't care what happens to them. No, God came to save everybody. And so Jesus through his acceptance of God's will, through his suffering and death um, and eventual resurrection, he reversed Adam and Eve's failure, uh, which was a rejection of God's will um, that ultimately brought sin and death into this world. So by Jesus's death, he brought life back into the world. And finally, Jesus filled over 600 Old Testament prophecies that came from hundreds or thousands of years before him. So Jesus was the final revelation of God to the world and his final act. But obviously we're still here. Um, so how can it be the final act, final saving act, if we're all still here and still being saved? Well, uh, this comes down to the resurrection, which if we believe it to be true, it's the biggest event that happened in history. It was proof that Jesus was actually who he said he was. Uh, it was proof that Christ and his teachings would not be a dead faith. So it didn't just die with him, but because Jesus was resurrected, he came back from the dead. Um, he's living. So our faith is a living faith. It's not just a dead one. It's not just something that some old guy a few thousand years ago talked about, but 
Jesus is still alive today and he still guides the church today. Um, and it's also proof that salvation ex is extended to everyone, uh, that everything that Jesus came and taught and spoke about on behalf of God had to be true because if Jesus resurrected, that meant that Jesus was God. And so that everything that he had proclaimed for God to his people that we see in scripture had to be true. And so uh, we're going to revert back to the reading that we talked about last time that was at the beginning of the, the PowerPoint, uh, Matthew 16, 13 through 20. And so when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. And so Jesus here says, you are Peter. So Peter makes a statement on who Jesus is, and Jesus in turn makes a statement on who Peter is. And so G Peter says, you are the Messiah. So you are our Savior, our God. Jesus in turn says, yep, you're right. You are now Peter. You are the foundation of my church. Um, and so what does Jesus mean by church? Well, we have our definition of the church from the Oxford Dictionary that says, uh, a church is a particular Christian organization, typically one with its own clergy, buildings, and distinctive doctrines. Um, but what does scripture say about what the church is? So the church here, as you can see in this little graphic to the side here, uh, it's God's kingdom. So it's his final covenant. Um, one of God's covenants in the Old Testament was to King David. So that's called the Davidic covenant. Um, in it, he says that I will make you a kingdom that will never end, and I will send you the Messiah um, that will always be on the throne of the Davidic kingdom. Um, we find out through Jesus that this is actually Jesus himself. So he is from the line of David. You can Jesus' uh, descendants comes from David. And so he is made king of this kingdom. And so also with this Davidic kingdom, there was a queen mother, um, and when King, or when King David was around, uh, his mother also was the second most important person in that kingdom. Uh, and that's just how kingdoms work during this time in this area. Uh, we find this in our current kingdom, so this final covenant, through our queen mother, Mary. And that's why the church has such a huge devotion to Mary, because uh, she is uh, hugely important to this kingdom and to this church. Um, and finally, the king points a successor and a, a royal steward. He gives them the keys to the kingdom of the house of David, um, and what he opens and shuts, no one else can open or shut. We can see in that quote there by Isaiah. Um, and like in the video, Jesus directly makes this statement to Peter. He makes him his steward. And who, who does this represent in the church today? Well, this is the Pope. So all of the line of Peter, everyone who's uh, came after St. Peter has been a pope. Um, and that's why we have uh, the pope in the hierarchy within the church. Um, so we have this kind of uh, authority within the church. Another reference of what the church is, it's the bride of Christ. So we see this in St. Paul's letters um, to the early church. Um, and he uses this kind of imagery uh, because when we think about marriage, what do, what do we think about? Well, it's two different people becoming one. So we hear this in the marriage readings, um, that two become one flesh. And we hear that's from Genesis, uh, where Adam and Eve, who were separated, are brought back together. Um, and so this imagery that St. Paul uses, that the church is the bride of Christ, 
Well, Christ and his church were separated from sin. And so with this, Jesus dying and resurrecting, he brings the bride back to himself. And so he brings the church and himself together to, so that they may become one flesh. Um, and so we get this also imagery of the mystical body of Christ. It's another term that's used um, to describe the church. Um, and we believe that uh, wholeheartedly that the church is the body of Christ on earth. And so we don't, obviously we don't have Jesus here walking around, uh, but the church is still here. And the church does Christ's actions upon the earth until he comes again. And so this shows the unity of the church with Christ at its head. So Jesus directs the church and continually lives with it, acts through it. But we are the ones who do the acting. We are the ones who do the service. We are the ones who bring God's grace into the world um, because we get to work with God. Um, and that's just a whole beautiful, beautiful imagery. Um, and I think that's super important to what the church really is, is that we're working with God. We're not working for God um, specifically. And then finally, we identify in scripture, uh, also in the creed that we pray at every mass, that there are four marks to the church. So there, it is one, it is holy, it is Catholic, and it's apostolic. And so what does this mean? Well, why we should, this is actually central to why we should believe in the Catholic Church as the Church of Jesus Christ. Because um, like we said earlier, there's a lot of different denominations, a lot of different churches that claim to be the true teachings of Jesus. Uh, but really, only the Catholic Church can hold that claim. And this is why. It has all four marks of the church. So one, it is the community of Christ. So like we said earlier, uh, Jesus has made the church a part of himself so that it might be one church, that it might come directly from him. This is the body of Christ. Uh, and it is not just something that's kind of uh, like the idea of a church. Um, so it's not one church that's connected by their beliefs, but it is a real foundational church. Um, and this is the church of the Catholic church that we find all throughout the world, but specifically headed by the Pope and the clergy all focused in Rome. Next, it's holy. So what does the church do? Well, it does the sacraments. So it provides the sacraments to the world. And what is a sacrament? Well, it's, it's a continual action of Christ's mission upon the earth. So God wants to give us real and tangible evidence of his actions um, and of his grace. And so he does this through the sacraments and ministers this through the church. Um, and not only is this for our benefit, just for it being adding grace into our lives, but it allows us to participate in the holy life of Christ. Because what are we? We are images of God. We hear that we heard this in scripture at the beginning of Genesis, that every man and woman is created in the image and likeness of God. And so we are made into better images and brought into a more fuller life in this image through participation in the sacraments. So through confirmation, through baptism, through the Eucharist, through reconciliation, through a marriage or holy orders, through the anointing of the sick, all of those sacraments are for our benefit so that we might be able to do the mission God has given us as a church. And then next is Catholic. So the word Catholic actually comes from the original Greek that the early church fathers used to uh, speak it, and also Jesus would have spoken as well. And that's also what the scriptures are written in is ancient Greek, because that was just the language that people spoke in that area during the time. And so what does Catholic mean? It means universal. And actually the first time that the church, because the church was one church until about 1054 AD. Um, so nobody really called it the Catholic church. It was just the Christian church or just the church. Um, the first time that the church is actually referenced as Catholic is from one of the early church fathers and a doctor of the church. Uh, his name is St. Ignatius of Antioch. So he was around 110 AD. So he was either the first or the second generation after the apostles. So he was very, very close to the time of Jesus and to the people who knew him specifically. And so he references the church as Catholic or universal. So again, we talked about how God's saving mission what God wants out of the kingdom and for us is 
that everyone is saved and nobody is left aside. And so the church, the Catholic church is universal. We see this, that all over the world, there are almost, uh, one, I think it's 1.2 billion Catholics across the world who practice the same beliefs in the same mass. And no matter where you go in the world, even if it's in a different language, the mass is still practiced the same, it's still the same sacrament, and you can still receive it fully um, because that church is universal. And finally, like the video we were talking about earlier said, it's apostolic. So what does this mean? It means the church has the authority to be able to speak on behalf of Christ. Um, so only Catholics can trace their origin back to Jesus. Um, this is because the Catholic church was founded when Jesus said, to Peter, uh, you, are, you are my rock that I will build upon this church. Um, every other denomination of Christianity can trace itself back to a breaking off of the Catholic Church, the first being the Orthodox Church back in 1054 when they split from the Pope. Um, other places like Lutheranism, Protestants, they all have specific people that broke off from the church and fed their own teachings. But only the Catholic Church can say, no, this is the church that Jesus founded, and it came from his apostles who cast it off. Um, the Orthodox can also trace their clergy back to the apostles um, because they, they also founded the same beliefs as Catholics. The Catholics are the only ones who can trace their origin back to Jesus. Um, so what the apostles did is they also gave holy orders to other people. So when Jesus left, and we see this in the Acts of the Apostles, the, the apostles spread out into the world and made their own uh, foundations in different parts of the world and brought different people into the church. The Catholic Church is unique in that our holy orders that our priests receive today, can there is a line that traces unbroken all the way back to those apostles. Um, and so that's another beautiful thing about why the church has this authority is because there is no break with the early church and Jesus. We are the only ones who can claim this unbroken line. And so we continue to pass on, to clarify, and to teach as Christ's body, uh, which is led by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus promises that we have an advocate uh, that will continually be with us. And obviously, Jesus, who's resurrected, is still alive. And so he's not going to let his church that he founded and is the head of uh, fall into ruin. Does that mean that the church is perfect? Absolutely not. There's plenty of evidence to show that there's people in this church who have done bad things, either in name of the church or for their own personal gain. Um, and that's not the claim when we say that the church is infallible, which just means that we are uh, safe from error. So everything that she teaches about Christianity is true. Uh, we're not saying that the church is perfect and the people in it are perfect. That has never been the claim. Uh, the church is actually made for those people who are broken, who are sinful, that they might be able to come into something more, to what they were truly made to be. And so we are imperfect people ministering to other imperfect people. But Christ continues to guide us and guarantee us um, that we will continue, even if it's shaky, uh, and sometimes we stray along or stray away from the path that we're continually brought back. And that's why we need authority, because we need this tradition, we need this scripture, and we need guidance to be uh, the people that we're made to be. And so I'm not the only person who believes that everyone should be Catholic. Uh, in fact, a lot of people profess the Catholic faith or the Catholic faith across the world. Um, but one of our very own is going to give her witness as to why she is Catholic. So Lisa is going to share why she is Catholic. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so I have been Catholic all my life. I grew up in the church, and I consider my Catholic faith as a gift that my parents gave to me um, at, when I was baptized as a baby. Um, and then they helped nurture as I grew up and our family was active in the church. But then over the years, as I've learned more about the Catholic faith and really kind of owned this faith, taken it on as my own, and become more involved myself, it's really become more and more important part of my life. Um, so there are lots of reasons why I'm grateful to be Catholic. 
and why the Catholic Church is the church for me. Um, first, and Kyle's already talked about this, is the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus established. And Jesus told Peter, you're the rock, and on this rock I build my church. And so ever since from the time of Peter, this, this deposit of faith has been handed down um, through the Pope, um, from one Pope to another, all the way down to our current Pope, Pope Francis. So I like knowing that this is the church that the, um, Jesus himself established, and um, this is the real thing. Um, and since it's been handed down from Peter and through the apostles, it means that um, the church has the authority uh, to teach us, as Kyle said. So there's, and there's a lot of, um, a lot of wisdom, I think, in the church. I know some people get frustrated that the church is um, too, too stagnant or too old fashioned and too slow to change. But I see um, what the church, I see the church's teachings as a positive thing because the church offers a lot of stability uh, through uncertain times. And the church doesn't just change with the latest trend. And we don't have a pastor that comes in and just, um, changes the teaching because he has a different opinion. Um, it, it, I think I really appreciate that the church has the, doc, the, the authority to teach us that the, the um, um, really what, what God intended. I also like the mission of the church. So our church is, is a missionary church and, and they uh, has a goal of reaching out to all peoples around the world um, to lead them to heaven. Um, and as part of this, the church has, gives us boundaries and, and guardrails. You know, starting with the Ten Commandments and the church doctrines, uh, there are lots, it may, might seem like a lot of rules um, I don't look at these rules as being a detriment. I look at them as uh, the church giving us a safe space to grow and to grow towards God and leads to heaven. Um, kind of like a playpen, maybe keeps a baby safe or a fence around a playground keeps children safe when they're playing. I think that the, um, the teachings of the church keep us safe and lead us towards God and help us to grow closer to God. Um, and I think the church has a big uh, positive impact on the world around us too. Um, this is also part of the missionary nature of the church. Some of you may have heard about Catholic social teaching. If you don't know what that is, um, there's several tenets of the, um, that we have about how the Catholic church should interact and take care of the world. And it's kind of based on the dignity of the human person. So each one of us is created in the image and likeness of God. And, and so each person has value, every single person around the world. Uh, and we all have rights and responsibilities, so each person has a right and a duty to participate in society. You know, no matter how marginalized they are, if they're a prisoner, if no, no matter what their state in life is, every person has a, a right and a, a duty to be part of us, part of our group. There's also the preferential treatment of the poor, so we're called to take care of the poor uh, around the world and the neglected around the world. Um, and rights of the worker is another tenet of the Catholic social teaching. And that means that, um, it, th that we should strive to have good, um, good working conditions for our workers and fair wages and, um, you know, and safe conditions for people to work in and solidarity. So we're all part of the same world. We're our brothers and sisters keepers, and we all need to work for justice and peace for all races, ethnicities, national, nationalities, and backgrounds. And the last tenet of the Catholic social teaching is about the care for God's creation. So we're all um, called to care for our earth and the environment. So I, I really value these tenets of the Catholic social teaching. Um, and, you know, I think it really, it shows um, ways that the Catholic church may, is making a positive impact around the world. And the church takes care of people all around the world too. So our Catholic church, through Catholic charities, we feed, um, and clothe the poor around the world. Uh, we have hospitals that take care of the sick and the dying um, that are established by the Catholic Church. And we have so many schools that are established by the Catholic Church to educate people of all levels. And you know, there have been times when uh, the poor didn't have a good way to get an education and the Catholic Church reached out and helped um, to make sure that the poor and um, disadvantaged people had a chance to have an education and so that they could grow. And the Catholic Church has some amazing and influential people um, throughout all of history. So if you, you can think about all kinds of, um, you know, the, 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 the li we've studied the lives of the saints, so we, we learned about the saints, but there are all kinds of other people too, scientists and mathematicians and uh, artists and authors and um, civic leaders that are all from the Catholic Church, so they really made a difference. So uh, the, the biggest reason I like to be Catholic is really because of the sacraments. 
So um, it's a very important part of the church and it sets us apart, I think, from other Christian denominations is the richness that we have in these sacraments. You know, Jesus was human, so he knew that as humans, we need to have um, concrete and real experiences. And um, so he established the sacraments for us. And so the sacraments are they're physical actions that we can experience with our senses, things that we can see and feel and taste and, and, and smell, and they give us God's grace. So I think these sacraments are a real gift to us and really help us to grow in our faith um, and make it easier, give us an easier path towards heaven. You know, we have the sacraments of initiation, so baptism and confirmation, which you all are preparing for. Um, and in these, um, you, we have the um, cleansing water and the scented oils that are signs of the grace that we're receiving from God. There are the vocation sacraments of marriage and holy orders, the sacraments of healing too, reconciliation, and anointing of the sick. And I mean, reconciliation can be really powerful because you can feel that great sense of peace after you've gone to confession. Um, it just really lifts the weight off of your shoulders. So being able to have that experience is important for me. And also anointing, anointing of the sick. If you've ever been with someone who um, was dying or very sick and you were able to be there for the anointing of the sick, it's a really powerful experience for that person and for their family. And my favorite sacrament is the Eucharist. So this is foundational. This is the source and summit. It's really, it's the core of our faith. Um, and this is because the Eucharist is the real presence of God. You've heard John 3.16, for John, uh, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So God loved us so much, he gave his one and only son for us. And he loved us, he loves us so much still that he wants to be close to us. Um, and he can't get much closer than the Eucharist. So God gives us this opportunity. We can go to the church, to Mass every day and receive the Eucharist. So physically receive Jesus, because Jesus is really present in the Eucharist. Every time we go to Mass, um, we're receiving Jesus. So I think that's a really... Um, really important part of my faith is to be able to receive Jesus um, so personally like that. And the more I know about the Mass, you know, we, we, so we receive the Eucharist at Mass, obviously. So the more I know about the Mass, the more I see that it's kind of a foretaste of heaven. It's like what we're going to be experiencing when we get to heaven finally. So we gather around with our friends and our family, and we have a chance to praise God. Um, we profess our faith, so we say all the things we believe in. We pray for each other in the intercessions, and, um, and we can offer our own things. So we have the collection, the offertory, um, so we give of ourselves. And we're fed by God's word, so we get to hear the scriptures, so we hear the priest's homily. And um, importantly, we're fed by Jesus himself in the Eucharist. And then after we do all that, we're sent out to go make a difference in the world. So... Um, just that's all wrapped up in the mass. That's what we're doing in the mass. Um, and we have an obligation each Sunday to go to mass, but I don't see this just as an obligation. I think it's a wonderful opportunity and I like to experience it as much as possible because it really sustains me and draws me closer to God. So as I said earlier, the church has a lot of, seems like, seems like they have a lot of rules, uh, but those are really meant to guide us to heaven. And so the rule of having to go to church every Sunday is really a, really for our own good. And it's um, really a lot of wisdom in that, knowing that we, we need that to sustain us throughout the week. Um, and I think the mass is so powerful in many different ways. Um, it, so I think back over, um, you know, the many, many masses I've been to, there, you go to mass in times of distress. I can think of an example when I was a high school student your age and um, a friend of mine died during high school. So we all kind of felt compelled to go to mass together. To, that's kind of what, I don't know, that's just what we wanted to do is to gather together and, um, and go to mass and receive the Eucharist. Um, in times of joy, so we gather for mass for weddings and baptisms. Um, like who doesn't like to see a baby getting baptized at mass and you know, sometimes a priest will hold a little baby up like uh, Simba on Lion King, and who, who doesn't find joy in, in welcoming a new person into the church like that? And um, we go to Mass in times of uncertainty. Uh, this is kind of before your time, but I remember uh, at the time of 9-11, there was such an uncertain time in the world, and nobody, we were really at a loss, and I think everybody, was just, the churches were packed. Everybody wanted to go to church and wanted to go to Mass because that's just where they found their peace. <clears throat> I've been to mass and location, you know, places all around the world, and I really like it's the same mass no matter where you go. So if I'm, I've been to mass in Europe or in 
El Salvador or here in the United States, it's all the same. You know, from you know, mountains in Alaska to the beaches in Florida, it's the same. And all the languages, it doesn't even matter if you know the language. So English, Latin, Spanish, French, no matter what language you're, you're listening in, you, you know what's going on because it's a familiar mass and you know, know the rituals. Um, and I've been to mass in beautiful cathedrals or in little rooms with dirt floors and animals walking around and it's all the same mass too. And I've also been to mass in great big celebrations with hundreds of thousands of people in the, um, in the presence of the Pope or a small intimate little mass with just a, a, a few of us, two or three of us uh, in somebody's living room. And it's, um, it's every time I go to mass, no matter what the conditions are, and I receive the Eucharist, it leads me closer to God and closer to my final destination, of it, which is heaven. So um, I'm really glad to have the Catholic faith and all these opportunities to uh, experience the richness of the Catholic faith. And I really think it's, the, it's what it makes it easier for me. It's an easier path to heaven for me. So thanks for letting me share that and for listening to all my thoughts on that. That's all I got to say. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's see here. So that kind of concludes our uh, talk for today. Um, like we've always done, we're going to head into small groups, uh, small groups one through three at four to 450, small groups four to six, five to 550. Uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at SBXYM1 um, to get the latest updates and stuff. Uh, Life team will be here tonight at 630 to eight. Ooh, forgot a zero there. That's all right. Um, we're going to be talking about exorcisms today. So it's going to be real fun, real crazy, real exciting. Um, the, I'm sure you guys are aware of the current situation uh, with COVID right now and how Marion County is uh, starting to lock down again and go into virtual. Um, this is going to be our last in-person confirmation until the, these restrictions are lifted. So. Uh, Please, if you feel unsafe or uncomfortable coming in person today, just let me know through uh, email um, before you get, or before it's your time. So before four o'clock if you're groups one through three or before five o'clock if you're four through six. Um, so that I know that you uh, are not comfortable with this and I will make sure to send you the online version um, of small groups uh, and that you don't get an absence counted against you. Um, but if you do feel comfortable and uh, you are safe and not sick, please do come because uh, we uh, would love to see you. And this will be the last time we'll see you before the new year. So uh, I'll see you guys in a few. Uh, if you have any more questions, make sure always email me. Um, otherwise, see you guys here.